Good morning. God's peace to you. Pray that you're blessed for being here this morning. At least it's air conditioned, right? We're going to wrap up our study today of the Apostle John's letters, his epistles, by looking at the third epistle of John. And this series has been uh, called Restating the Gospel. Restating the Gospel in John's epistles. And the reason, of course, is John is writing toward the end of the first century. um, And there's already false doctrines being taught. There's already challenges to the truth of the Gospel. There's people who are leading Christians away from that truth. And so John is coming back to say, hold on, let me restate the the core gospel, the foundation for our faith. Now, as we looked at chapter, uh, or uh, the first epistle of John, we see that he lays out that concern. He lays out um, his arguments for how to be discerning about uh, who is truly from God and who isn't, and, and how to test the spirits, how to understand those who are speaking with apostolic authority and those who are going in a different direction. Then in 2 John, we see his more personal letter to the church, uh, which he calls the elect lady, maybe even just a house church within uh, the church of Ephesus. And he speaks to them and encourages them to remain faithful uh, and true. Now in 3 John, we see that John writes to a specific individual named Gaius. Uh, And who he is is uncertain. We know little of him other than what is found here in this uh, small little letter from the Apostle John. Gaius was a very common name in the Roman Empire at that time. There's other uh, people in the New Testament referred to as Gaius, but it's unlikely that the one here is uh, one of those other Gaiuses that we read about in the, the New Testament. Um, he was probably a member of the church in Ephesus and attended one of the many house churches in that, uh, in that church. And it's possible, we also read about two other people in this letter. We read about Diotrephes, and then we read about Demetrius. Diotrephes is presented by uh, John as uh, a bad example, uh, and Dimitri, uh, Demetrius is, is uh, presented as a good example. And uh, Gaius is really the recipient of the letter, but it's to us, it's something that we can learn from in terms of how we live out uh, the, the faith once delivered by all, uh, for all. He, he shows us how to do that. And let's just begin by looking at our text. Again, it's a very small letter, so we'll read it in its entirety and then go back and notice a few things. So John begins writing again as not the apostle, but the elder, right, with that pastoral heart. He says, the elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. For I rejoice greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. Verse 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers who have borne witness of your love before the church. If you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well. Because they went forth for his name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. We, therefore, ought to receive such that we may become fellow workers for the truth. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. Therefore, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds, which he does, prating against us with malicious words. And not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren and forbids those who wish to putting them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has a good testimony from all and from the truth itself. 
And we also bear witness, and you know that our testimony is true. I had many things to write, but I do not wish to write to you with pen and ink. But I hope to see you shortly, and we shall speak face to face. Peace to you. Our friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. In this short little letter, we begin to see how Gaius is the standout Christian among the church at Ephesus. How he is doing exactly what the whole church should be doing, and yet the whole church is not doing that. The problem, it seems, is in the area of hospitality. Now, hospitality is the truth of the New Testament, that Christians ought to be hospitable. Now, when you think of hospitality, probably the first thing that comes to your mind is, in, at least in the United States, is southern hospitality, right? Biscuits and gravy, uh, maybe chicken and dumplings. Uh, maybe you're thinking about somebody stopping by and sipping some iced tea on the porch. If you're in the south, it would be sweet tea. That's the image we get in our mind of uh, having people into our homes and uh, meeting their needs in the moment. And that gets us maybe halfway to what the New Testament idea of hospitality is. The actual word that is used, that's just, is tr uh, translated as hospitality in the New Testament, it means love to strangers. Not strange love, but love to strangers. Well, what does that mean? Well, in the day of Christ, in the day of the early church, the apostles, you didn't show people mercy and love and goodness unless you knew who they were. You just didn't do that. Is my mic not working? Yes, it's not working. So I should use this? Okay, all right. <laughs> I'm kidding. All right, so... Um, so love to strangers was something different, something new, something that you wouldn't normally see in uh, John's day and age. They lived in what was considered an honor and shame culture. And so you would do good to your own, but you wouldn't do good to those that you didn't know. In fact, those that you didn't know were considered a threat, um, a possible enemy, uh, somebody to be leery of. And... Christianity changed all that. It changed all that. Now, one of the reasons it changed that is because of what we see here in 3 John. We see that the early church had a practice of sending around itinerant preachers and teachers of the gospel. Like Jesus did in his ministry when he sent out the 72 by 2. And they would go and preach the gospel in, in the cities in the, the surrounding area. And if Jesus said, if they welcome you into their home... Uh, that's great, Re be received and, and take what you need and then go on. If they don't welcome you, kick the dust off your feet and move on from them. Well, this practice was common in the early church where uh, disciples would go out preaching and teaching the gospel all around the regions. And John has sent out some of these teachers. But there in Ephesus, there was a church leader named Diotrephes who would not receive them not even upon the authority of the Apostle John. Gaius, though, he did welcome them into his home and show them hospitality. And this follows what the Apostle Paul uh, taught in Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, beginning there, verse 6, Paul says, Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do, all, do good to all, especially to those who are the household of faith. Now, we read this passage many times as just an admonition to, to do good, to be good do-gooders, right? That's what we see here. Do good to all, especially to those of the household of faith. Well, right there, you begin to see that there's a distinction between 
uh, just simply being a do-gooder and being a Christian who does good to all and especially to the household, to the family of God. And within the context, back to verse 6, it has reference to those who uh, receive the teaching of the word. The spiritual reaping should also be sown. And that, that uh, doing good, of course, refers to uh, supporting those and sending them on their way uh, with whatever they need uh, to go on and teach the gospel. Well, this is the issue at hand in 3 John. Now, there's a couple things I want to notice in the first few verses. So if we go back to uh, 3 John, looking there in verse 2, you notice that part of the greeting to Gaius is that he would uh, prosper in all things and be in health. In fact, this is probably the most um, exemplary of ancient Greco-Roman letters that we find in the New Testament where the greeting, in fact, sometimes the greeting would just be used with initials, and we kind of follow it in our English letters when we say, I hope this letter finds you well. Anybody write that in their letters? Because you write letters all the time, right? Does that not get into your emails or your text messages? It used to be a common thing when you'd write a letter to say, I hope this letter, as I send it, sometimes it would say, or as it leaves me, finds you well, right? So you get the letter, and the question is, did you, when you got the letter, were you well? Were you in good health? That was a common greeting during uh, the days of the early church. And so John's following that greeting, but then he adds something to it, doesn't he? He says, just as your soul prospers. And this is my justification for a, a lot of my um, research in pastoral theology, which is around the health of the soul, that you can have healthy spirituality and you can have unhealthy spirituality. And here we see an example of that in the New Testament. Uh, Paul talks about it in terms of sound or healthy teaching, sound or healthy faith. John here talks, it about, talks about it in the sense of your soul prospering as your health may prosper. Now, recently I went to the doctor. It's, it's all good, but he says we need to talk. And so this week, I think it's, what, the 17th, I go back, and we're going we're gonna to talk. I already know what he's going to say, right? You probably already know what he's going to say. Just, you, you can tell. But... Uh, Sometimes we have to check in on our health, our physical health. And we're so concerned about our physical health that we go to the doctor and we, we try to improve and we try to take care of ourselves physically. When we pray, how often is it that we pray about matters of physical health? That seems to be at the forefront of our minds. And yet John is just as concerned about the spiritual health the health of Gaius' soul as he is about his physical health. And of course, he has heard good news about Gaius. Uh, Gaius has welcomed these uh, teachers of the gospel that have been sent out by John into his home. He's provided to them, shown them hospitality. And then those people come to John and they give him the good report. And what does he hear? That he hears, uh, he hears that John, uh, Gaius rather is uh, a man who is in the truth. Remember John's first epistle where he talks about being of God, being in the truth. He talks about like who is somebody you should listen to, somebody you should uh, trust, their testimony, their witness. It's someone who is of God, who's born of God, who is of the truth, uh, someone who is grounded in that apostolic teaching. And, of course, this is the, the witness they get, the testimony that uh, they give to John about Gaius. And so in verse 4, he says something just uh, beautifully put that I think we want to take attention to. He says, I have no greater joy than to hear my children walk in truth. Now, a lot of times parents will read this and immediately resonate with that because they understand what it means to have a child and want the best for that child. That's just natural to want the best. In fact, most parents want better for their children than what they had. Sometimes that can go wonky, but, but the desire is to see your children 
do well, to be safe, but also to, to do well. And part of doing well as a Christian parent involves that our children would become believers and that they would walk in the truth. And so I read this text and I, I resonate with that as a parent. And I know that you, if you're a parent, you resonate with that as well. But John's not writing just in the sense of being a parent of a child. He's thinking of his role as the pastor, right? He's not writing as the apostle. He's writing as the elder. And he's thinking about the spiritual interests of Gaius and all those he considers his children in the faith. And so it indicates that John, in some sense, has taken a parental role of the church at Ephesus as one of the elders. And perhaps even in a deeper sense, we don't know, but maybe he was involved in Gaius's new birth and his becoming a Christian. And so he considers himself a father in the faith. Paul talked about this in his relationship with Timothy when he said, Timothy is my son in the faith. And there's a, a beautiful picture there of, of someone that you have brought to faith in Christ and you've discipled them. You have no greater joy than to see them walking in truth. Why is that? Because as a Christian, we don't want to just hoard and, and keep the blessing that we've received from God to ourselves. We want to share it with others and we want to see others receive the blessing that we've received in Christ. In fact... There's no greater joy, John says, for him than to see his children walking in truth. And if you've ever had the opportunity to be a part of someone's conversion story, that word conversion, we don't necessarily like it in today's world. It sounds a little too preachy. But it's a beautiful word. It's the word to be changed to be renewed, to be converted, to turn. Uh, Peter says in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, turn and be converted that your sins might be blotted out. And if you've been a part of that process with someone where they have heard the gospel, believed it to the salvation of their souls, and began walking as a disciple of Jesus Christ, walking in the truth, if you've been a part of that process, you know what John's talking about here when he says, I have no greater joy than to see my children walking in truth. It's the evangelistic spirit within each Christian to see others know the Lord, to know him, to experience the joy of our salvation. Well, then John goes on to talk about the fact that Gaius has been hospitable. He has done what Paul talked about in Galatians 6. He's, he's sown to spiritual things, and he's now reaped spiritual things. He's been part of the process. In fact, here in, uh, in uh, the book of Hebrews, we get a little more of a definition for uh, hospitality in Hebrews chapter uh, 13. <clears throat> We're told not to neglect hospitality. Yeah, do not forget to entertain strangers, the text says there. Uh, that's the word for hospitality in the New Testament, entertaining strangers. That, that doesn't necessarily mean, uh, you know, being a, a busker on the street or, or you know, like those folks in uh, San Francisco on the pier that are doing all kinds of acts for the public. That's not the idea at all. It's, it's a combination of that bringing someone into your home and meeting their needs and the fact that you're showing love to someone that is a stranger. Now, the idea is radical for early Christians uh, for, the, for that time. And notice what the Hebrew writer says. For by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Now, that is not a promise that every time you show hospitality that you're going to have an angel show up. Okay? We need to read the Bible with the Old Testament lenses uh, that help us understand the New Testament. And if you read Hebrews chapter 13... And hear what he's saying here. You remember that moment when Abraham was visited by two strangers. And he showed them hospitality. Only to find out that they weren't just men. That they were angels of God. Now, the fact is, you never know. You never know. 
who you might show hospitality to. And so you don't want to be unhospitable because you could miss out on blessing someone in a special way. Well, this teaching here, um, this practice of the early church, and what John says here in 3 John kind of parallels, but in contrast with 2 John. Notice he says, uh, what you've done, you've done faithfully. Verse 6, he says, um, if you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well. Some translations say, if you bid them Godspeed. That's the old English way of saying it. So you have these teachers of the gospel coming in. You don't know them. They're new to you. They need somewhere to stay. There's not a Motel 6 in town. There's just your house. And so you invite them in. You meet their needs. You support them. And you send them on their way, right, as he says here, um, in a manner worthy of God. You send them forward. And that idea of sending forward actually had the connotation of you're providing for their journey, too. So Gaius would not only meet their needs at his home, but he would also give them a, a little something to take on their way. Uh, when my, what would it be, grandfather, great-grandfather, my great-great-grandfather, T.F. Thomason, was a preacher who actually rode horseback. And uh, he farmed, and then during the summers, he would go hold revival meetings and he rode horseback, and very often what he would receive as he was heading out of town from the, the congregation where he had held the revival would not be money. This was Depression-era kind of stuff. It very often was what is sometimes called a wet chicken. Have you heard of that? Or he would receive some food to take on his way to make it to the next place, uh, or he'd receive some sort of uh, uh, clothing or blanket. And this was the way they would send him forward on his way. That's the kind of thing that Gaius is doing. He's showing hospitality. And he's doing it for the good of Christ's gospel. It's an amazing thing. Now, this is opposite of what is warned against in 2 John, there in verses 9 and 10, where... In 2 John, it says, whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. Then in verse 10, it says, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him. And then he goes on in verse 11, says, if you do, you're sharing in his evil deeds. So one of the things that we see here is that Gaius is exactly the kind of Christian that John has been encouraging us all to be in his first and second letters. And now in his third letter, he says, here's, here's what I'm talking about. Gaius, who's discerning, who is able to see who is carrying the, the truth, the gospel. And then he becomes a participant in that, as opposed to being a participant in sharing in a false gospel and the evil of spreading false gospels, John is saying Gaius is one who is a participant in the true gospel. Well, we ought to be the same. We ought to be the same. And that's the principle that uh, John gets to here in verse 8. He says, we therefore ought to receive such that we may become fellow workers for the truth. Now, this is an important principle for those of us who may not be like my great-great-grandfather going around holding revival meetings or not like those who go on missions and, and are missionaries throughout the world, maybe, maybe here even the United States or, or across the oceans, whatever the case may be. Maybe you don't uh, have opportunity or, or have a call to that kind of ministry, but you still can be, as John says here, a fellow worker for the truth. Paul talks about this in the book of Philippians. He says, you are partners with me in the gospel because they had provided to his needs. When we support missionaries and we support missions uh, in this country and throughout the world, we are partners in that gospel ministry. 
And so it's a powerful thing to be like Gaius. And many of you are great examples of what it means to be like Gaius, how you are so generous and so missional-minded, even though you maybe aren't on the front lines of the mission, you're missionally-minded in supporting those who are on the front lines. Okay, well, there's Gaius. Now let's get to Diotrephes, this rascal. Diotrephes. What's up with him? Well, I'll give it to you in John's terms. He says, Diotrephes loves to have the preeminence and does not receive us. In uh, psychological terms, we would say that Diotrephes has malignant narcissism. Okay? Which is essentially to say, he likes it when people like him. And he wants to be first, which is what the literal language of preeminence means. He wants to be first. First. Listen to what James says about this kind of attitude uh, in James's letter in James chapter 2, uh, beginning there in verse 1. He says, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality or favoritism, some translations say. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings in fine apparel and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him you sit here in a good place and say to the poor man you sit there or sit here at my footstool have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts this is exactly what we see Diotrephes doing right he wants to be first. He wants the preeminence and to ensure that he does not receive, John says, he does not receive us. Now John is not going there. Who's going there? The ones that John sent by his apostolic authority. Can you imagine if an apostle sent a preacher to your church and you said, I'm sorry, you're not, you're not welcome here. And he says, well, I came here by the authority of the Apostle John. And you say, yeah, 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 but I'm the big dog around here. You need to go. That's called malignant narcissism. <laughs> okay, That's like, whoa, right? Somebody who loves the preeminence. And I do think if you study the history of the early church, I think this is one of the reasons that the early church began to develop what was called the mono-episcopate. We read about um, elders or presbyters. We read about pastors or shepherds, we read about bishops or overseers in the New Testament, and it looks like during the first century, those roles were all um, played by a, a, a group of men who were called the presbytery or the eldership. They all acted as overseers and uh, presbyters and uh, pastors. Some, th there's some indication in Timothy's writing that among that group of elders, there would be those who labor or spend more time preaching and teaching or laboring in word and doctrine, um, Paul says. As time went on, the church began to expand the roles and make some distinctions between those roles. And the first one was this distinction between um, a single bishop, a mono-episcopate, um, and this single bishop would be over a region of churches, probably uh, you see a little bit of this in um, Justin Martyr, where it talks about the president of the eldership, in, in English, the president, the presiding elder, um, and that would usually be over an eldership that was uh, overseeing a citywide group of house churches. Right? There was no church buildings until much later in the history of the church. But the mono-episcopate probably grew out of that, where the presiding elder not only was the uh, the presiding elder of a, an eldership over a citywide group of churches, but then house churches, but then that that expanded to regions. And you can see why this would have developed because they're sending preachers and teachers from one city to another and there's rascals like Diotrephes who are saying, you can't preach here. And they're like, wait a minute, I've, I've got uh, apostolic authority from John. And so eventually you could see how that would develop where they would say, okay, we need somebody to preside not just over a citywide group of house churches, but maybe over a district or a, re a geographical region. And then it just expanded from there and, and, and grew in terms of the hierarchy of, of governance. Now, for good or ill, that's probably what happened. And 
the disease that was perhaps the reason why this development in church leadership happened uh, starts with this situation here, with, with people like Diotrephes who are not willing to uh, receive apostolic authority, who are not willing to uh, let those who are bringing the gospel and welcome them into the church. Instead, they're keeping them out and they're wanting to have the preeminence. And of course, that is a sure sign, a sure sign that somebody is a false teacher, is they become divisive. They become divisive. They want to have the first place and they will not receive us. In fact, uh, you notice in verse 10, it says that he doesn't receive them and he puts them out of the church. Now there is a place for church discipline. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 5 when you have somebody who is in unrepentant immorality and you've tried to address it with them and they just won't won't give it up, you know, they won't repent and you know, you have to you have to let uh, that play out according to um, the, the standards of God's word. There's cases where um, people are divisive in, in Titus chapter 3 where they're, they're causing division in the church. It may not be a false teaching per se, but it could be someone who's just, just splitting up, creating drama, causing division. Uh, those kind of people, uh, probably a lot like Diotrephes here, need to be dealt with. But Diotrephes, he's putting people out of the church just because they threaten his position just because he doesn't want to have any competition. And so if you disagree or you uh, don't want to go along with what Diotrephes says, then he's going to get rid of you, right? So one of the reasons we don't practice a ton of church discipline is because it's hard and difficult and we try to be gracious, honestly. We try to be gracious. Maybe there's times we're, we're too gracious. But another reason is because we don't want to be like Diotrephes. We don't want to be just uh, dividing up the church, and we don't want to be uh, taking the place of Christ in the church by saying we have to be first, whoever that we is. We don't want to do that. You know, there's been lots of churches where somebody came along and started attending and then within a few months uh, they, they, they're they starting to take in leadership roles or they're starting to get a little group around them and then pretty soon there's trouble in the church and there wasn't trouble before but now there is what happened well, diatrophy showed up that's what happened so we have to keep our eyes out for this kind of malignant narcissism within the church because it does nothing but cause damage and the the cure for it is that we would yield to the apostolic authority. If he would have just said, you know what, John is, is an apostle, I'm going to receive those who are sent by him, then he would have been faithful just like Gaius, but he did not do that. And so John says in uh, verse 11, Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil has not seen Again, John ties uh, belief and practice, right? He ties orthodoxy with orthopraxis. And what you believe ought to be evident by how you live, is what John is saying. And who is the good? Well, the good here is obviously Gaius and what he's doing. Who is the evil? It's Diotrephes and what he's doing. But then, so we've gone through Gaius, we've gone through Diotrephes. What about Demetrius? What about Demetrius? Well, Demetrius, he has got a good testimony. Everyone knows Demetrius, and everyone would say Demetrius is a good guy. In fact, Demetrius' testimony is not just from other people, but it's from the truth itself. Think about that for a minute. Jesus talked about it like this. He said, You'll know a tree by its fruits. A good tree produces good fruit, and a bad tree produces bad fruit. So you can tell if a tree is good or if it's bad by its fruits. Demetrius was known by all to be good. He had a good testimony. But the reason 
was because you could see it in his life. His life was an exemplary picture of the truth. Like Gaius, who was walking in truth and how he showed hospitality, Demetrius was walking in truth and people saw that and bore witness to it. Now, John wraps it up here and he says, I, I want to say more things, but I don't want to say them to you in a letter. I want to speak to you face to face. But I want to say to you that we, we've learned a lot from John in this study. We've learned that there is a core gospel. It's the gospel that says Jesus Christ came in the flesh. And that's so important because without the incarnation then the cross, the crucifixion, and the death, burial, and resurrection loses its meaning completely. We, we don't have any hope of salvation or forgiveness because there's no atonement of our sins. The sacrifice that Jesus offered was just some man dying on a cross. But if he was, in fact, God made flesh, Jesus the Messiah come in the flesh, then it has so much more meaning. And that's where we need to go back to every time somebody comes along with another teaching, a different gospel, as Paul would say. We need to go back to Jesus. We learned that even though we struggle with sin and that tension is always there for us, for us who are uh, still in the flesh, still struggling with the sinful nature, that we're not to be dominated by sin. We're not to continue in sin, but we're able to be in the truth and be born of God and not dominated by sin because he is faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. We learned that we can always seek the, the true gospel from its roots, from that apostolic authority. As John said, that which we held, that which we handled, that's what we seen with our own eyes. We delivered that. We shared that testimony with you. As he says here to Gaius, receive us and walk in truth. What could get in the way? What could get in the way? Well, Diatrophies shows us what gets in the way so often is pride. Almost every single time we veer or stray from the truth, it's because we're unwilling to yield to God's word, to God's way, to God's will. Listen to what the Proverbs have to say. A book of wisdom. Proverbs chapter 11, there in verse 2. When pride comes, then comes shame. But with the humble is wisdom. Colloquially, we say pride comes before the fall. If you don't want to fall away from the truth, if you want to stay in the gospel that John has restated for us in these letters, then humble yourself and say, I will do whatever I need to do to be faithful, to walk in the truth. And if that means showing hospitality, if that means discerning between those who would lead me astray, if that means confessing my sins that I may be forgiven, not denying them but confessing them, then that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to yield. And I want to offer this word of yield to you this morning. What do you, what do, you do when you're driving along and you see that yield sign? What's the first thing you do? You slow down, right? Hopefully. You slow down. You don't speed up, right? You slow down and you look to see if somebody else is coming so that you can yield and let them have the right of way there. But when we yield to God, what we're doing is we're slowing down our will, our wants, our desires. We're slowing down what I think is right what makes sense to me, and I'm going to look for what God wants, what God's will is, what, what his logic says, and I'm going to yield to it. 
Now, it's not just talking about egregious sins. It's talking about our whole way of life. And so, as a pastor, I want to say, I have no greater joy than to see disciples of Jesus who are living for his will by yielding to God, following the example of Jesus, the example of the apostles, the example of Gaius and Demetrius and all those who have walked faithfully throughout the years. May we yield and not be prideful. May we yield and do his will and not ours. And when we do that, when, when we yield, guess what happens? Your will becomes God's will. You want what God wants, and you start to desire the things that God desires. And pretty soon you find the joy that is in our salvation. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you, we praise you, and we honor you for who you are and for what you've done and what you're going to do. We thank you for Jesus Christ who gives us hope, life, and peace. We thank you for the sacrifice that he made on our behalf that we might be forgiven of our sins and reconciled to you. May we stand firm in this truth and walk in this truth. May we see that, that this truth is the truth that gives us hope and life eternally, but also that it motivates us to walk in love in showing hospitality and doing good to all, especially those of the household of faith. We ask this for the sake of your son and in Jesus' name we pray, amen.